Hello and welcome back to Skypothesis, vanilla Skyrim character builds. It's time for the season 5 finale and this one may be the most unique build we've made to date. It's our very first dynamic build, a character who changes as the adventure before him unfolds. This is the Ninth Priest, a completionist build that will allow you to complete every questline in the game with the roleplay tied to his progression from Nordic warrior to dragon slaying enchanter. This Nord grows increasingly vile and corrupt as his dragonborn power grows. His quest is to claim the power of the ancient dragon cult to become the greatest and last dragon priest. In this build, we will be diving into theories revolving around the dragon priests, the dragonborn, and the mysterious mask Conoric. As always, we have timestamps in the description so that you can easily navigate to any point in the video, but we hope that you stick with us through the entire thing. And just a reminder to check out our merch shop and our Discord server if you want to support the channel and join the community. But now, without further ado, let's jump into the backstory of the Ninth Priest. Snow fell on the city of Bruma, covering the proud stone walls and cobblestone streets with a blanket of silence. A sane person would stay inside on a night like this, enjoying a warm hearth and a hot mug of mead. The glowing windows scattered through the dark snowstorm showed just that. But Alastor, the newly appointed court mage, was without hearth and mead that night. He perched atop the city walls, dark eyes ever watching. An icy wind cut through his wool robes. It was not yet winter, but the cold was becoming quite unbearable. The portents read of a growing power localized in this very city. He could feel it. Tonight was the night a great evil was to be born. Suddenly, Alastor could feel a shift in the plane of Aetherius. He cast Clairvoyance, conjuring up a glowing beam forming a direct path to a small home. Alistair leapt from the stone wall and gracefully floated to the stones below. He sprinted towards the home, praying to the divines that he wasn't too late. What sort of evil creatures were hiding in the city? Vampires? Slodes? He conjured a bound dagger in preparation. Gathering all of the courage he could muster, he burst open the wooden door and was dumbfounded to see a young Nord couple swaddling a newborn baby. They looked up in fear and shock at the dagger-wielding mage silhouetted in the moonlight. Alistair stared at the baby and gripped his dagger. Was this truly the great evil written in the portents? It had to be. He had followed clairvoyance for years leading up to this moment. But as he stared into the eyes of the frightened young couple holding their firstborn son, he knew he couldn't go through with his mission. He dismissed his dagger and disappeared into the snowy night. That boy was named Conoric Darkmoon. Conoric means someone who has triumphed in war, warlord, or vanquisher in the dragon language. The name was passed down through generations in old lore and tomes, and his parents thought it fitting for their youngest boy. Little did they know he would one day shape the future of Tamriel. As the years passed, Conoric grew into a strong young man. The Dark Moon family had a history of imperial service, but now were simple farmers. Conoric would work the fields by day and train with his father and brothers by night. Sometimes he would spar with the neighboring Redmane boys who became some of his greatest friends. Though quite strong, his strength paled in comparison to his brothers in the Redmanes. He found that his cunning is what helped him win sparring matches with their battle axes. Life was peaceful and all was good in Bruma, until one morning the Dark Moon family awoke to a declaration nailed to their door. The Redmane family had openly denounced the Empire and was fleeing Skyrim to join Ulfric's cause, stating that all proud Nords should do the same. Conoric's parents were too old to make the journey themselves, but they agreed with the Redmane's sentiment and reluctantly gave their blessing to Conoric and his siblings to enlist his Stormcloaks and fight for the freedom of their homeland. His world quite literally turned upside down overnight. He fled with his brothers in the middle of the night, trudging through thick snow and evading Imperial patrols. Despite the discomforts, the Darkmoon boys were excited for an adventure that lay before them. As they neared the border of Skyrim, high in the Dral Mountains, a sudden arrow pierced Conoric in the shoulder. He fell to the ground in shock, horrified to see his own blood staining the snow red. He turned to see three other quick arrows pierce through the chests of his brothers, toppling them to the ground before him. An Imperial soldier clad in iron slowly walked up the hill toward Conoric. He tried to lift his axe, but quickly blacked out. Conoric awakes on the prison cart. The horrifying death of his brothers, still fresh in his mind, shook him to his core. Not one week before, he was at home happily with his family, and now here he was in an executioner's cart with none other than Ulfric Stormcloak. And this is where your roleplay begins. In our previous videos, we provide general quest lines and playstyle information in this section, but as the Ninth Priest is a dynamic character, we will be taking a more hands-on approach. Conoric doesn't become the sinister Ninth Priest overnight. At this point in the roleplay, his heart is broken by the death of his brothers, and he is motivated by a hatred of the Legion. 
We have split the roleplay into three distinct phases, with a somewhat steady progression from warrior to a thief and mage. Each phase will see Conoric use a distinct armor combo until he rounds out his look with the completion of these phases. We really wanted to try something new for this build and are excited for all of you to go through this phased descent, or ascent depending on how you look at it, from the young Nord farmer to the vicious and cunning Ninth Priest. And again, we wanted to do our best to make a completionist build that truly rewards you for completing each questline, but still allows you to enjoy a large chunk of the game fully kitted out in your final armor combo. Certain armor pieces are not available until many vanilla questlines are completed, so it is important to save the entire Dawnguard and Dragonborn DLCs for after the completion of the Ninth Priest's three phases. You will be at your most powerful then, fully kitted out, and you'll be able to take on Harkon and Mirak as the fully realized version of the Ninth Priest. So let's jump in to Phase 1. Phase 1 is Conoric's first steps in Skyrim. He will take the buff of the Warrior Stone, and for armor he will wear the Torturer's Hood, Stormcloak Quiris, Fur Gauntlets and Boots, and wield a Skyforged Steel Battle Axe. The skills and perks used will be limited to Two-Handed, Block, and Restoration. Though it is a good idea to start hoarding Soul Gems for enchanting, as it will be his only perked crafting skill in the long run. When he first arrives in Whiterun, he stops into the Temple of Kinnereth, where he observes the priests healing the sick. He thinks to himself, If only I had known a bit of that healing magic, things might have ended differently for my brothers in the mountains. In an effort to appease the pang of guilt in his soul, he takes up the study of restoration. However, restoration is the only school of magic he will tap into at this point, as this is his warrior phase. He came here to join the rebellion, and join the rebellion he does. He is a proud Nord who, at this point, desires nothing more than to head straight to Windhelm to join Ulfric's cause of freedom. However, he makes a quick stop in Whiterun to deliver news about the dragon attack. This turns into a critical mission related to the court mage's research, and within the first few days in Skyrim, he learns he is dragonborn. The most pressing thing on his mind is still to put down the Empire and grow into the strongest warrior he can be, and he selfishly thinks that the Greybeards can teach him sources of power that might tip the balance of war in Ulfric's favor when he joins the fight. However, the Greybeards were disappointing isolationists, and he chose to move on from their tutorship after learning the full unrelenting force shout. He is now ready to join the Civil War in earnest, and the Stormcloaks are his first priority, but the invitation to join the Companions also comes just at the right time. What better way to train for civil war battles than with the strongest warriors in the province? Phase 1 will be completed when the Civil War and Companions questlines are completed in their entirety. We chose to alternate questlines back and forth, roleplaying that he trained with the Companions in between important civil war battles. Of course, the beast blood of the Circle came as a shock to him at first, but Conoric found that he truly looked up to Kodlak. The old man reminded him that he had the power to choose how he reacted to any situation. He would see this quest through to the end, and chooses to cure himself of beast blood alongside Kodlak Whitemane. Conoric takes pride in knowing that he has bested her scene and overcome the temptation of power. If only he knew what temptations still remained before him. Killing Tolius is a major victory and he revels in his triumph for a time, but finds himself feeling increasingly empty after the Civil War. Whiterun lay in ruins, with Vignar Greymane doing nothing to repair it. Life continued on like normal. Vampire still attacked, bandits still raided. Was Skyrim actually better off, severed from the Empire? Those thoughts clouded Conoric's mind as Phase 1 comes to a close. Phase 2 begins with Conoric still feeling jaded and betrayed. Whiterun is still in smoldering ruins, and Ulfric has done nothing for the people. Even the time he spends in Temples of the Divines and Shrines of Talos leave him feeling empty. He knows now that the honor of war is all a lie, and even the companions are just mercenaries who will kill for money. They are willfully ignorant of the fact that their founder, Iskramor, wielded enchanted weapons and rode a conjured storm bear into battle. He found their distaste for magic too hypocritical to continue hanging around them. He checks in with Delphine, who is now ready for the next phase of the plan, which is infiltrating the Thalmor. The questlines for Phase 2 include the College of Winterhold, the Thieves' Guild, and continuing the main quest until Parthenax tells you to find an Elder Scroll. Similar to Phase 1, we will prioritize the main quest first, as it includes natural introductions to the Thieves' Guild and College of Winterhold, which we will work into his story. The armor he wears will change to reflect his new lines of work, and will include mixing the Thieves' Guild armor and robes from the College. Unfortunately, after arriving at the college, he discovers that he has not the skill nor the money to afford lessons and pursue the clever craft. A broken, destitute veteran, he now wants nothing more than to access these incredible mages who could teach him how to unravel the knots inside his own soul. In order to pay for his lessons, Conoric goes back to Riften. 
where the Thieves Guild were so desperate for muscle that they picked him up off the street to run a quick job. We roleplay that Conorick's jobs for the Thieves Guild are what allow him to afford tuition at the college. He uses his money earned on these illicit adventures to finance his education and lives a double life for quite a long time. He spends a few days at the college, studying, running errands for the teachers, and honing his mind, then spends a few weeks sorting out the affairs of the Thieves' Guild and earning coin. During some of these thieving missions, he kills unsuspecting people from the shadows with a dagger for the first time. To his surprise, he felt no shame or remorse. The Guild had a policy of non-violence, but that was hardly practical when surrounded by mercenaries and hired thugs ready to gut you at a moment's notice. Conorick is a fighter, now forged in the flames of the Civil War and among the ranks of the Companions. If he was ever discovered in the shadows, he wouldn't hesitate to fight back. Though he doesn't realize it at this point, his dragon blood enhances any talent that he seeks to develop. He was good at anything he put his mind to, and in a few short seasons, he found that he could move unseen in the shadows as well as any thief in the guild. The money was useful, of course, but more than that, he was enjoying his new line of work. So much so that he decides to strike out on his own small contract in Windhelm. He sympathizes with Aventus Aretino and decides to help him out. What was supposed to be a favor for a lost kid turns into an invitation to join the actual Dark Brotherhood. He takes it slow with this faction, unsure yet at this point if he wants to join in earnest. He accepts Astrid's invitation, but hesitates to report to their headquarters, for now. At the college, he continued his studies. He learned not only restoration magic, but he developed a quick affinity for illusion and enchanting as well. Conjuring bound equipment was very interesting to him. With a simple spell, he could conjure forth a battle axe of the Daedra, light as a feather and more deadly than Skyforge steel. This discovery proved most useful in his thieving endeavors, as he could now be protected wherever he went without drawing attention to himself with a mighty axe strapped to his back. Quick side note before moving on, we've always felt that the College of Winterhold and Thieves' Guild tie together nicely, and characters that can do both are a ton of fun for us, mostly due to the precedent set by Enthir and Gallus' friendship. Gallus was an astute scholar, but felt more at home living the life of a thief. Phase 2 is completed when the Thieves' Guild and College questlines are complete. We are saving Dark Brotherhood for Phase 3. The last moments of Phase 2 are spent in the Archmage's quarters, as he reflects on his fight with Moroke in Labyrinthian. This was his first encounter with the Dragon Priest, and he was fascinated. This was an ancient wizard of unspeakable power who covenanted to serve the dragons as leaders of their wicked dragon cult. Even Savos Aran and his cohorts were unable to defeat him, and he knows the only reason he won is because Moroke was not expecting his physical combat prowess. The withered old lich could do nothing as Conorick shouted become ethereal, walked harmlessly through the intense siphon of the Staff of Magnus, and pummeled him to the dust. Had he only relied on magic, he would have been soundly defeated, just as the previous mages were. He resolves to discover all of the ancient dragon cult's bastions and put down the dragon priests permanently. Phase 3 begins with Conorick having gone through a major transformation. His love of honorable open combat has been replaced with a love of the shadows. His desire for strength and prowess replaced with a thirst for knowledge and greater arcane powers. For this phase's gear, we mixed Dark Brotherhood gear, Mythic Dawn robes, and Volsung to represent his sinister descent. He dives deeper into the world of the shadows by officially joining the Dark Brotherhood, and on the side continues his private research on the ancient dragon cult. He has been infected with the idea that he must have more power to fight Alduin. He systematically locates and defeats all of the other priests to steal their power. In his quest, he learns what it truly means to be a dragonborn. He is every bit as much a dragon as he is a Nord mortal. He is a Dova, he is a dragon. His soul feels called toward the dragon cult because the dragon cult is him. We made sure to have all of the other priests killed before chasing Alduin into Sovngarde, and we wanted to immediately return to Labyrinthian with all of the masks where he will be rewarded with one of his own. There are a few theories out there about Conorick and his mask. The game doesn't give us very much to go on, but that means more room for interpretation. We've chosen to subscribe to the idea that there was no Conorick during the time of the Dragon Cult, and instead the mask is a creation forged by the combination of all the slain Dragon Priests. Like a true Dova, he gains power by slaying his foes, and his gilded mask is forged from the powers he stole from the ancient priests. The pedestal was built due to a prophecy of a ninth and final priest who would rise above all ranks. The cult awaited their new leader's arrival, but were killed off before this prophecy could be fulfilled. Completing the Dawnguard and Dragonborn DLCs are like a victory lap for this build. Harkon is a new adversary, and Mirak is the Dragonborn's perfect foil. They are incredible villains in their own right, and can feel more compelling to fight than the literal force of nature that is Alduin. 
We waited to engage with these quest lines until the ninth priest was kitted out in his awesome gold trimmed robes. However, there are some very useful black book powers that you may want to acquire earlier in the playthrough if you want. One of the struggles of having a completionist type character whose aesthetic is determined by late game gear is not having enough to do once you're fully kitted out, but saving the DLC content for last is a great way to ensure you still get plenty of gameplay and quest lines with the now sinister Ninth Priest. Alright, let's discuss the gear for the Ninth Priest. Conoric wears a unique armor set that we call Gilded Robes of the Final Priest, which we think looks the part of a fanatical, all-powerful tyrant. He will wear Conoric, the Jester's Boots, Vampire Gloves enchanted with Fortify Two-Handed and Fortify Magicka, and the Emperor's Robes enchanted with Fortify Health and Fortify Illusion. The Vampire Gloves spawn randomly on vampires and may be difficult to obtain, so you can totally wear the standard brown gloves from Radiant Raiment in the meantime. He will also wear a gold ring enchanted with Fortify Two-Handed and Fortify Restoration, and a gold ruby amulet enchanted with Fortify Health and Resist Magic. For weapons, he will switch between his Bound Battle Axe for open combat and Merun's Razor for stealth kills. We've never used this dagger in one of our build videos before and thought the Ninth Priest is an appropriate wielder of this legendary dagger. Now for spells and shouts. As a completionist build, he occupies a bit of each of the three broad character archetypes, warrior, thief, and mage. With this in mind, there's no reason why he can't learn a wide variety of spells for situational use. However, we found ourselves keeping his general spell selection very simple. He will mostly use bound battle axe, invisibility, and healing spells like close wounds. For shouts, the quiet casting perk will give us access to silent shouts, which opens up a world of fun options for this sinister priest to pull off from the shadows. Our most used shouts were Bend Will, Soul Tear, Whirlwind Sprint, Cyclone, March for Death, and Dragon Aspect. Moving on to the Ninth Priest's stats and perk spread. We leveled him with 1 in Magicka, 3 in Health, and 2 in Stamina. He needs the extra health for tankiness, and since he isn't slinging spells all of the time, we didn't prioritize having a large Magicka pool. Since he is not wearing armor or using alteration, we are using the Lordstone for extra armor and magic resistance. Keep in mind that most of our builds are balanced for the standard Adept difficulty. Finally, we are playing as a Nord for his backstory, and because it's only fitting that a completionist Dragonborn build be a Nord of Skyrim. By the time you reach level 50, you'll want the following perks. In two-handed, take all five in Barbarian, Champion Stance, Devastating Blow, Great Critical Charge, and Sweep. In sneak, take all five in Stealth, Backstab, Deadly Aim, and Assassin's Blade. In Illusion, take Novice through Expert, and then the right side to get Quiet Casting. Take all five in Enchanter in Enchanting, Insightful Enchanter, Corpus Enchanter, and Extra Effect. In Conjuration, take the Novice and Apprentice perks and Mystic Binding. You could head further up the tree to get Soul Stealer, but since we are pretty much exclusively using the Bound Battle Axe, we didn't feel it necessary to Soul Trap everything. In Restoration, take the Novice through Adept perks, Regeneration, Respite, both perks in Recovery, and Avoid Death. Finally, in Block, take all five in Shield Wall and Quick Reflexes. Because he is not wearing armor or using alteration, blocking with his battle axe is an important defensive layer for this character. At later levels, the alchemy tree will help immensely with both survivability and damage output. Fortunately, enchanters don't need to add perks to the alchemy tree when they can instead craft themselves a full set of gear with four pieces that can each improve crafted potions. This is a great idea if the bound battle axe starts to feel outleveled during tough encounters. Fly Amanita and Dragon's Tongue are common enough ingredients that you can easily stock up on fortified two-handed potions without needing to farm alchemy. Alright, it's time for our favorite part of every build, the special moves. Like all Dova, the Ninth Priest gains power and knowledge from his slain enemies. His special moves reflect this, each having been learned from a worthy opponent during his journey in Skyrim. His first special move is Rebel's Vengeance, performed by using Dragon Aspect, a fortified two-handed potion, and Marked for Death. This move combines three ways to increase the raw power of his axe, and is the result of endless sparring contests with his childhood friends in Bruma, where he learned from the Redmain clan to never back down from a fight, and that there is always a way to rise past the level of your opponent. His next move is called Blink, performed by using Whirlwind Sprint with Quiet Casting, Use this move to teleport through the shadows for the perfect stealth kill. He learned this during a duel with a powerful vampire knight of the Volkahar clan. Next up is Banishment, performed by using Nightingale's Strife and Soul Tear. 
This quick succession of abilities deals a massive 400 points of damage almost instantly, and raises your target as your personal meat puppet. One quiet night in Eastmarch, a magician tried to toy with the Ninth Priest's mind. Conoric escaped with both his life and a new ability. Next is Reign of Fire, performed by using Bend Will, Secret of Arcana, and Fireball. Bend the will of a dragon, and when riding high in the sky, use Secret of Arcana to remove the Magicka cost for spells, and cast a 30 second barrage of fireballs to the ground below. On the island of Solstheim, the Ninth Priest witnessed a minotaur dressed Bosmer commanding a horde of beasts. Anyone who could command such authority could certainly be learned from. And his final special move is one unique to Conoric, called Second Wind. This move is integral to keeping the Ninth Priest alive, and is a passive ability that combines the effects of Conoric's Mask and the Avoid Death Restoration perk. Both have a small chance to heal you before death. Just when his enemies think they have bested him in open battle, his birthright as Dragonborn takes over, either from the Mask's power or from Avoid Death. There is also a chance that Conoric will summon a Dragon Priest to aid you in battle, fitting for this grand gilded priest. And with those special moves completed, it is time to finish this build video and our fifth complete season of Vanilla Builds. Skyrim is a game that keeps on giving, and even in its pure vanilla state has endless storytelling and roleplaying possibilities. With this season completed, we are looking forward to the next phase of the channel. We've had ample time now to explore the ins and outs of the Anniversary Edition, and are excited to release more builds featuring the new content. Starfield's release is inching closer, and we can't wait to explore Bethesda's newest role-playing game with you all. As always, thank you for supporting the channel by watching our videos. This is a wonderful community, and we're grateful for your efforts to keep the magic of Skyrim alive. We will see you next time, right here on Skypothesis.